Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us today here. Uh, we're here for DAT 304, DynamoDB, What's New? Uh, I'm Jim Scharf. I'm the general manager of DynamoDB, and I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about all the uh, developments we've had in DynamoDB over the last year, and including some of the features that Andy announced at the keynote today. Uh, you ever have one of those bad dreams where you're about to, you know, after a year's worth of work, you're about to present to a large audience, and you wake up in the morning and you've lost your voice? Uh, well, that's me. Uh, so the good news is we have Andrew Certain here, who is a senior principal engineer on DynamoDB and a longtime Amazon veteran. And so he's going to uh, do most of the talking. I might chime in here or there, and then I'll be the demo dolly. So with that, Andrew. So yeah, uh, as you know, in AWS, we like not to have any single points of failure. So we're going to see how this works when it comes to these talks. Um, all right. All right, so a uh, quick show of hands. How many people here use DynamoDB? OK, not surprisingly, quite a few of you. Some of you haven't. If you haven't, I hope that after you hear this talk, you're inspired to check it out. We do have a free tier, so uh, there's really no excuse. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't realize, you know, we have over 100,000 AWS customers who trust DynamoDB with a wide variety of use cases. My guess is almost everybody in here used DynamoDB indirectly uh, in the last week, either booking travel through Expedia, Airbnb, taking a lift to or from the airport, shopping, Amazon, Nordstrom through the Cyber uh, Monday, uh, Black Friday weekend, or maybe just relaxed using Comcast, Electronic Arts, PlayStation, Netflix, Nexion, Zynga, you know, it could go on and on. So um, all these customers use DynamoDB for these mission critical use cases with availability, scalability, performance really matter. Uh, before we talk about where we are today, I want to just talk a little bit about where we've been. Um, I started at Amazon in 1998. Uh, we were on Oracle databases, as you know. Um, every year, I was on the performance engineering team. We had a bake-off between various hardware manufacturers to see which one was going to be able to get our main database through the holiday season. In 2004, we had actually moved to Oracle Rack, which was a cutting-edge, multi-node database, and we thought we were going to be great. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the Amazon website in 2004. We had a somewhat simpler layout, a few fewer categories. I don't know if anybody bought the sidekick off that. Uh, it's a great phone. Um, unfortunately, uh, in uh, December of 2004, we had a big outage. And if you're a retailer, you go down for several hours in December. It's really bad. So we decided we needed to take a step back, figure out what to do. Werner Vogels wrote um, a blog on this, I believe. Uh, he gathered a team of us together to think about, OK, how can we build a database that's really built for Amazon with scaling at the forefront? One thing we realized is that 90% of the features in Oracle we never used. So uh, as many of you may know, we came up with this thing called Dynamo. Um, it was deployed in 2005 for the holidays. Everything's been much smoother since then. It was really a seminal paper in the industry. It introduced the NoSQL category. Uh, AWS was just taking off at this time, and we figured if internal customers found this useful, external ones would. It's how a lot of these AWS businesses were born. Um, so a wide range of Amazon businesses use Dynamo now. Uh, the biggest customer of DynamoDB is actually AWS itself. When building a new uh, AWS region, you can't even get EC2 started without DynamoDB. So we are in every region. We're at the core. We are. Uh, tier zero or tier minus one or how, any, how far down you want to go service. Um, in addition to AWS, obviously internal is a huge, uh, Amazon internal is a huge customer outside of AWS. It powers the website, as I'm sure you know. It powers our fulfillment centers. If DynamoDB has any problems, literally the conveyor belt stop moving. They have to send people home. It's a huge problem for Amazon, the, the retailer. Alexa is also powered by Amazon.com, so if, uh, I mean, by DynamoDB, so if uh, we have any problems, you can't uh, get the weather or whatever you want to do. And I just want to um, give a quick shout out to the authors of the DynamoDB paper. It was just honored with a uh, ACM Hall of Fame award and the most influential operating systems papers. Okay, so that's great for um, what Dynamo did from a technology point of view. That's not the only thing that you have to worry about when you're running a big database. Again, when I started at Amazon, um, we had this thing called DB Cabal. 
And if you were a software engineer and you wanted to go and launch a new feature or make a change, you had to go to DB Cabal, which is where the DBA sat and they looked at the schemas and they looked at if you wanted to add an index or maybe a column and what that was going to do to performance. And, and it really made innovation harder because you had the central committee, it was a bottleneck. We were growing like crazy at the time, um, as we still are. Uh, and it, 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 was, it was a problem, it slowed things down. So what do we do? Well, we have Dynamo, NoSQL really started to come out. The developers could just launch their own databases, right? It was awesome. You didn't need any schema, and there's no problems, right? Well, as those of you who operate these databases probably know, when you get rid of your DBAs and your system engineers, you haven't just gotten rid of thing, uh, you know, people that aren't doing anything, right? They're doing a lot of important work, right? Security, durability, availability, performance, scalability, these guys are focused on doing this all the time. And if you just say, okay, software developers, you, you know, you just download this thing, you launch it, it'll be great, it's, it, it, it is good for development, but you gotta do all these things, you gotta do it all with no downtime. And for those of you who are running your own databases out there with your software developers, you know, do you know, are you fully patched um, with all the security advisories? Are you on your database's latest version of the software? All these things are important, um, and they're really hard to do when uh, you've got this distributed environment. Uh, Werner Vogels has talked about the you build it, you run it culture. Certainly, from the time I started at Amazon, we had a strong culture of pushing autonomy down as far as possible, and part of this breaking up of the database was part of that culture, um, which is now called DevOps. We didn't know that was the name when we started doing it. Uh, but what it really means is, if you're a software developer, you have to do these other jobs too, right? You have to be a, a DBA, you have to be a systems developer, and you know, you're in the middle. And while you know, I enjoy the freedom of doing it, it makes my job really hard if I have to concentrate on all these different things all the time. And if, you know, if you're out there, if you're the CTO, you've just signed up for ensuring that tens, hundreds, thousands of teams are all doing this thing, all keeping everything up to date, all doing it right, making sure the availability is up. Um, and you've got to find people that can do all these things. Okay, so the Dynamo people created NoSQL, solved one problem of rigid schema and, some, and scalability, but it just created another problem. And so what's the answer? And of course, since you're here listening to me, I'm going to tell you that DynamoDB is the answer. Um, so, you know, one thing we do is we handle the ops so that your software developers can really, you know, focus on the development. And um, so, our database scales because it's a horizontally NoSQL, um, but the administration scales because we manage it for you, okay? So uh, at this point, I wanna just look quickly at some of the features that we've already shipped to you this year, including uh, through today. Uh, first in the area of security. So um, for those of you who pay attention to this stuff, we adhere to a bunch of compliance regimes, PCI, ISO, FedRAMP, et cetera, et cetera. We have various access control features, both on the data plane, fine-grained access control at the row level, as well as on the control plane level, you can use things such as MFA to protect against table deletions. We have all the Amazon AWS standard monitoring with CloudWatch, CloudTrail, CloudConfig, all that stuff. Uh, Client-side encryption library integrated with KMS, and um, probably most of you know we operate in AWS's secret and top secret regions, which has a very demanding customer when it comes to secrecy. I want to talk about two particular uh, security features we launched recently. One is VPC endpoints. So uh, until before VPC endpoints, if you wanted to talk to DynamoDB, you had to go out to the internet. So you were running all your stuff in a VPC. It was all secure, really exciting, except that to talk to DynamoDB, you had to have an internet gateway, uh, which is still protects you against traffic coming in, but it does provide avenues for data exfiltration, for example. And so with VPC endpoints, you can have your endpoint for DynamoDB right there in your VPC. You don't have to have an internet gateway. Um, it, it greatly reduces your uh, surface area that your security guys have to worry about. The other thing that I am announcing, which Andy didn't talk about the keynote, is encryption at rest. It is coming soon. We've tried really hard to have it available for you today. Um, didn't quite make it, but it will be coming very soon. Again, it's fully managed, easy to set up, table level encryption. It's gonna meet all the compliance regulatory requirements. It's integrated with KMS. It'll allow customer encryption keys, uh, all that good stuff you come to um, uh, uh, expect from AWS. And uh, it will not have any latency impact. Okay, durability. Yeah, all right, thumbs up. Uh, durability, so um, 
As you know, DynamoDB is always multi-AZ durable. We always write all of our uh, data to at least two AZs synchronously. Uh, even if a server, rack, whatever fails, DynamoDB keeps on going. Um, and uh, you can do cons consistent reads or eventually consistent reads, depending on what you want to do. Adding to the durability story, as, as we announced uh, earlier today, we're announcing Backup Restore. Uh, so uh, today we're announcing and is available on-demand backups. So those are really intended for compliance purposes. So you take a backup maybe every month, you store it for five, seven years, whatever your um, regulatory requirements are. We're going to be adding point in time restore very soon in 2018, which will allow you to say, hey, I want to roll this table back to uh, yesterday or whatever, so that if your application goes and disrupts some data, uh, you'll be able to recover it. Uh, we're going to um, launch it with a 35-day window. Uh, and uh, all of these features will have no performance impact to your table. So I know a lot of you have been doing backups, say, through data pipeline, where you come in through the front door, you consume your read capacity, it takes hours, uh, it causes operational problem. And really, that's been the story of database backups from the beginning of time, right? So um, for those of you who remember uh, you know, having a big database box somewhere. You know, when the backups happen, you try to do it in the middle of the night when the load was low and you tried not to impact anything. And, you know, we have single tables in DynamoDB that are over 100 terabytes spread over hundreds or thousands of servers. And uh, you go in, you hit take backup on the console, and right away it says done. Um, so uh, we're really excited about this feature. We've been working on it for a very long time. Uh, we've got a lot of folks who've um, given their heart and soul to this feature, and so you know, I hope you check it out and, uh, and use it. Talking about it's one thing, um, my, uh, backup or my demo assistant is now going to show you how it actually works. Uh, and one thing on the durability of Dynamo uh, natively, which I've been, talked to some customers they don't quite understand, is you know, if a server, like, in all likelihood, a, a hard drive on DynamoDB failed uh, already in this talk uh, here. And we automate all that kind of stuff. So a server, a hard drive, a server rack goes down. We're taking care of that automatically. You're not getting paged, and we're re-replicating that data to make sure that your data is durable. Uh, so with that, hit the... OK, so I basically have a table. Just insert, I'm inserting some items into it just to give me some traffic. You can see here uh, the, the latency's varied a few milliseconds depending, frankly, on whether I'm plugged in or on the Wi-Fi. Um, and now if I go to my table, I see it's you know, a decent size, 27 gig, uh, 18 million rows. So I want to take a backup because let's say we uh, need to do a monthly backup or uh, we're about to do a major version upgrade of my application software or something, and I just want to uh, persist that. So I create a uh, uh, backup on table number sales data. Uh, sorry, I didn't pretend. <laughs> Whatever. I didn't do it one-handed uh, in my <laughs> winning practice. Reinvent. Oh, and uh, sorry, I, I forgot to warn you. It's done. Uh, and now you see that backup is there. And then if I go back to my November sales data uh, metrics, rather. Uh, and I'm not going to stall and, and wait, but basically, trust me, if, you, if we wait here for another couple minutes, you're going to see uh, that the performance is consistent. And you don't need to trust me. You can go create a table right now in your account. Um, it's on right now in uh, uh, ID, uh, so US, US. US West 2, <laughs> US East 1, yes. and EU. West one. Yes. So you can go create a table in any one, one of those environments right now. Other regions coming very soon. Yes. Try it. Okay. So with that, it was pretty simple, but that's the that's the whole point. It's fully managed. It's instant. Uh, handle scale, uh, and there's no performance impact to your application. Okay. And we've restored ter terabyte, multi terabyte tables. Uh, we have people using it in preview, and it, it just it just runs. It's awesome. I'm very excited. OK, what about performance? I know you guys really are interested in DynamoDB performance. Um, you know, we launched DynamoDB with the mission of being consistent, low latency, right? So here's um, some graphs from an upcoming blog post where uh, one of our um, 
Uh, one of our employees scaled a table up to over a million requests per second and back down to zero. I'll be talking about the auto scaling part of that in a second. The point here is there's only a three millisecond variance between the fastest and the slowest request, whether you're talking uh, you know, a handful of requests a second up to a million requests per second. So um, we're pretty excited about that. Now, single digit milliseconds is great. Uh, some of our customers, especially those in ad tech, tell us that that is not fast enough. They started using caching, putting memcache uh, instances in front of their DynamoDB, which is a lot of work, a pain in the butt for them. Uh, so we built DAX. For those of you who don't know, DAX is the DynamoDB accelerator. It's a purpose-built cache for DynamoDB. It is API compatible with DynamoDB, so you don't have to change your applications. You don't have to worry about um, populating the cache. It's right through. Uh, you can read all this stuff. I won't uh, you know, just read the slide. Um, but certainly for those of you who have very read-intensive workloads, um, it can both save you money because you're not paying your uh, RCUs to DynamoDB as well as be much lower latency. Um, in fact, uh, you know, we've, we've seen an order of magnitude lower latency from milliseconds to microseconds. So uh, very excited about that. And we uh, have new regions and instance types and um, uh, APIs coming uh, all the time with DAX. All right, along with performance is always scalability. So DynamoDB, you know, from the very beginning was built to scale. Like that was the primary reason that we uh, built uh, the thing for Amazon at the beginning, and we built DynamoDB now, thousands of servers. So you just put data in and it just scales up. Your table gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You don't have to do anything. Um, but scaling down was still kind of a pain. Like, how do you decide which things to delete? You'd have to go in and delete items one by one. You'd have to scan. It consumed your table um, IOPS. So in February, we added TTL. Uh, and so with TTL, you can add a field in your table, which is the expiry time. And when that time happens, we automatically delete the item for you. It doesn't consume any of your IOPS. We have a customer tune, which has purged 85 terabytes of data, reduced their cost by $200,000 a year. Uh, internally, we have uh, our CloudWatch team use DynamoDB to store data points. And what they would do is every time period, they'd create a new table, scale it way up, put data into it. Then it would age out, and eventually they'd delete the table. It was a, you know, they had to manage making sure the table was created in time, delete it. When they turned on TTL, now they just have one table. They don't ever worry about it. It reduces all their um, op operations considerably. It's really exciting. So that scales storage up and down. And then what about IOPS? Um, we have auto scaling. A lot of customers have really um, taken advantage of this. Again, this picture is from a blog post that's coming out about, you know, zero to a million and back. Um, and so. You know, in a, in a traditional database where you own these boxes, you try to figure out what is the maximum amount of load I'm, I'm going to need, and then you add some fudge factor, and then you find the smallest box that it'll fit in, because if you're wrong, you have downtime, right, which is horrible. But you, and scaling is hard because you'd have to transfer to a new box type. So you're overspending, which made your customers happy because you never went down, but it made your CFO really unhappy because you're paying, you know, for like 90% of stuff that you don't use. Um, so with auto scaling, it's great. You just set it, forget it. It ramps up when you need it, it ramps down, and you're only paying for what you need, but you get what you need all the time. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some scaling success stories later on in the talk. Um, auto scaling has all these features. Uh, it's run through any scale, which scales all sorts of AWS resources. They just added ske scheduled auto scaling. So if you know, hey, it's you know, Cyber Monday, I know I'm going to have this big load. I don't want to wait for the reactive scaling. You can set a setting to say, hey, scale up at this time, and um, it'll take care of all that. So in terms of scalability, we have single tables serving, you know, millions of requests per second with trillions of items and hundreds of terabytes of storage. And I realize that most people in this room do not have tables that are that big, at least now, but I'm sure you're hoping that they will be in a few years. Uh, I think it can be really... Um, Nice to know, though, that other people have pushed DynamoDB this high, right? So you don't have to worry, um, you know, is this the next scaling limit for the system or whatever? You just know, you know, there are massive customers like Amazon and others that are pushing the system beyond where you are, and you don't have to worry about it. All right, finally, availability. Um, so DynamoDB, keep talking about it, built with high availability in mind. Uh, we spread the data across multiple AZs disk, server, whatever can go down. You just keep on, on uh, delivering your data. 
Customers, though, more and more are taking a more global view on availability. So Andy announced this morning global tables. And um, global tables is a new feature, allows automated replication of data through your choice of AWS region. So you can set up on the console really easy. You just go create a new table. You say, I want it in this region, this region, this region. And then you don't have to worry about you know, monitoring queues and making sure the replication's working. We'll do that for you. Again, it's uh, generally available today. We hope you check it out. And with that, take it away, Jim. OK, thanks. So just uh, going back to that backup, just still uh, generating the traffic, and you can see consistent performance. OK. So what do we want to do with uh, global tables is I'm going to create a new table. And I'm going to assume I'm you know, doing a ride share app or, or whatever. It could be different, you know, a website or whatever. And I'm based in uh, Oregon and uh, in Ireland, right? So I'm going to create the table rides. ID. Do you want me to type for you? No, that's all the typing I have to do. <laughs> Here, um, just so you guys understand, you know, the auto scaling is on by default. Um, if you ever want to look at the settings in here, you can go in and, and play around with it. Um, but uh, most, most people, including myself, just choose the default. And I create the table, take a few seconds. And especially for global tables, we really encourage auto scaling because you, know, you can have reads coming from in different regions and your rights are going to be spread around and it just it's a lot easier if you let auto scaling take care of it. Um, yep. Uh, and then, so now you'll notice this global tables tab over here. Um, and you'll see that uh, in order to create a global table, I have to have streams on. And uh, at the moment, global tables are only for new tables. We will be adding support for bootstrapping existing tables over time. Um, oh, can you make the thing bigger? Uh, <laughs> Here, let me try. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. Maybe not. Hold on, give me a second. Is that big enough? Is it good? Can you see in the back? Yeah, thanks for calling out. Um, okay, so now I'll just enable streams. And now I will add uh, regions to this global table. So, for example, I, I said I was going to do Ireland, so I'll do that um, and hit OK. Uh, that was actually pretty quick. Oh, here. So now what it's doing is it's creating a uh, table of uh, the same name and layout in Ireland. And now it's applying the same settings I have in uh, Oregon, which is the one, my source one that, that I'm in. So if you see up here, I'm still in Oregon. But now I just created a table over in Ireland. Uh, so if I go over to my tables here, I see this rides table was just created. Uh, and then I can add multiple. So let's just add US East. Same thing. And then you can add as many uh, that we have. Uh, so currently, like we said, we have those five regions. Uh, we'll be looking to add more over time. Um, but you can have as many as you want in the replication group. OK, so now let's go. Um, I can create a item. And then, you know, you can a flexible schema, so you can basically just add whatever you want oh, from Portland. And now, so I see that here written in Oregon. And now, if I go over to my rides table over here, I see hello from Portland. You also see that we had this timestamp um, in the region that helps us resolve any conflicts. And then, of course, you can just do here. Uh, 999 and string back at you. Save. And then you see it here, and then it'll go back here. And then when I refresh, it'll be there. Uh, but that, didn't, that demo seemed kind of lame to me because uh, it doesn't really convey, <laughs> convey the uh, multi master. Uh, so here, what I'm going to do is drive some. Traffic. 
He's a manager, and he got to write some Python. This yeah, is the I, most I, fun I, he had I, all I'm, year. I'm going to show. I'm going to show all the guys back in the office. <laughs> uh, and so now, all this is going to do is just drive some uh, traffic into the table, like my other one did. Uh, the point here is you'll get local latency. Obviously, I, I didn't create an instance in Dublin, uh, so this one's going a little slower. But if this was running in Dublin, you get local read and write latencies because they're interacting with the local uh, tables in the region. And then you come back in here, and now as you refresh, you see uh, uh, records from Ireland and USA mixed in here. Uh, so you know, we think this is really powerful because now you know, the, the, the amount of muck, we did have some customers who did uh, multi, you know, cross-region replication before. Uh, Under Armour was a customer who gave a talk last year who did, did that. Um, but it was a lot of muck. And then we've, I've talked to other customers uh, here uh, yesterday who said, yeah, we tried. It was a pain. We stopped. Can you have a solution? And we said, yeah, show up tomorrow. Um, and, and we have it. <laughs> so we think it's really powerful. Uh, Another thing, I won't take the time with a demo. Uh, another question came up is, hey, well, now that I've uh, replicated, say, this data from Oregon uh, to Dublin, you know, can I go over and to, say, uh, you know, US East, and can I back up the table? So US East uh, has the items as well, uh, because uh, he or she, uh, let's call it a she, uh, was in that replication group just kind of listening. I wasn't writing to it. Uh, and now I could go in and back up the table, um, and, and we think that's an interesting uh, use case as well. So uh, with that, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Jim. All right. OK, so um, the, you know, the main point here was we've delivered a steady cadence of features here, all behind the scenes, no downtime. You know, your developers didn't have to go and upgrade to get a new version of the server. You didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Uh, so TTL, scale down your storage automatically, auto-scaling, scale IOPS up and down, DAX, in-memory performance, security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OK, but as you know, at Amazon, we don't really like to talk about ourselves that much. We prefer to talk about you guys. So I just want to talk about a few customer stories that really emphasize some of the advantage of, of DynamoDB. We found a lot of customers wanting to migrate from Cassandra. It makes sense. They're very similar APIs. Um, we talked to a lot of CTOs who say, hey, Cassandra worked really well when we were small, but now we've scaled up. We got lots of nodes to take care of. We're spending a lot of time managing those nodes, again, doing the upgrades, handling failures. Uh, we just don't want to spend that time. And actually, we're finding a hard time hiring enough people that have the expertise. So uh, it's really pretty simple to migrate from Cassandra to DynamoDB. Um, Samsung is one customer. They uh, you know, you can see these stats. They migrated a bunch of that out of Cassandra. And all those developers that used to be focused on supporting those instances are now focusing on delivering features for Samsung. And I just want to add, they gave a talk earlier in the week. Uh, if you look it up on YouTube, they had shared some pretty impressive stats. They have uh, almost, a pe uh, almost a petabyte of data uh, with DynamoDB. That we're backing up with no downtime. Um, Another one, obviously, is MongoDB. Uh, this company, PatSnap, uh, migrated a bunch of their data out of MongoDB. And again, the story is always this very similar. Hey, the developer, they downloaded MongoDB. They got it running on their laptop. They deployed it on a node. It was running great. And then we had to scale, and we had to figure out sharding. And you know, it's hard to, to migrate. We heard, I, heard, I talked to a customer yesterday who you know, we asked them what version of MongoDB they're on. And they said 341. And, they said, we, you know, we tried to upgrade, um, but we're running on a very large instance type, which not very many other people do. And so we often run into these problems. And um, you know, I, I know I'm sort of you know, beating the same drum over and over, but I think it is really important to think about how much time you might be able to save and how many more cool things you can do for your customers if your developers don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Finally, we have uh, people migrating from you know, the gold standard, Oracle, uh, RDBMSs. 
Um, Amazon uh, gave a uh, talk or giving a talk tomorrow. I think, I think it's uh, Friday. I think it, it might be Mike Thomas. It's something like moving from hundreds of, of databases to just one DynamoDB. I think it's on Friday morning. So this is a um, internal application called Herd. I actually, uh, way back in my younger days, managed uh, a team in Amazon called Customer Order Workflow, which was the workflow system that took orders from the website and fulfilled them. So customer work order workflow was cow. Um, the next generation of this, there were lots of them, and so they called it herd. Um, and it eventually was running over hundreds of Oracle hosts. And uh, they migrated to DynamoDB, got off of those hosts. They don't have to worry about those anymore. And workflow processing delays dropped. You know, effort, maintenance, and scaling effort dropped. So it's a really exciting talk. Uh, if you're interested, you should either try to get to it or watch it on YouTube. Okay, but how do you migrate to DynamoDB? Um, it is not, you know, uh, zero cost in terms of effort. We do have some tools to help you. Um, one is called the Data Migration Service, which uh, I encourage you to check it out. They're currently running a special um, right now uh, where you can try it free for six months. And uh, we have lots of tar uh, sources like Oracle, SQL Server, MongoDB. Um, you can go to the website to see the complete list. But uh, you basically set up DMS and um, configure some mappings of data, and then it'll put it into DynamoDB for you. It won't, uh, unfortunately, rewrite your app. Uh, we're talking to the machine learning guys. They've done some amazing things. Maybe next year uh, we can deliver that for you. No promises, though. Uh, all right. So. Um, just, you know, what have we been talking about here? DynamoDB, you know, serverless is this great thing that people have been talking about. We think DynamoDB fits really well in this, um, in this um, paradigm. You can see all these attributes. I won't, you know, read the slide. You go from one request per second to millions. Capital One, just on Saturday, wrote a tech blog about how they process billions of financial records in DynamoDB. And I believe that was a sort of bursty workload that they use Lambda for, is that right? Yeah, they, they use uh, Lambda and DynamoDB. Uh, it, it, if you just Google search for the Capital One Tech blog, uh, I just came across it on Saturday. It looked really good. And then, yeah, on this one, I just, I, even today I've been seeing tweets of customers who've attended other uh, workshops on Alexa skills or serverless and saying, hey, why, you know, why is Dynamo always paired with uh, serverless? And, and really, I think it is. You don't have any servers, particularly with auto scaling. The uh, scaling is just aut automatic for you. Uh, you don't have all the administration burden we've been talking about. It kind of goes away. Uh, it's in all, you know, because we are the underpinning for pretty much, you know, a lot of other services. We're in all AWS regions uh, at the start. Uh, and then your scale, you know, you can develop for, you know, your, your one Alexa app for, you know, you, you, you give it to your kid and have your kid try it out. And then if you put it out there and you think, hey, well, now I might get two customers or I might get two million, you don't know. Well, with DynamoDB, that's pretty simple. And, and DynamoDB can handle that scale and absorb it, whereas if you choose something else, uh, it can be more difficult. And then, you know, we're trying more and more to integrate uh, with AWS Lambda and the other uh, things in the AWS serverless ecosystem. Okay, a few more customer stories that I'm super excited about. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but the Cubs won the World Series last year. Uh, so um, Cubs made the last out. This is a picture of that. Um, this is not the only photo of this moment this, that was taken. Uh, it's the first time in 108 years that they won the World Series. Everybody pulled out their phone, took a picture of where they were, sent it to all their friends. Um, one of our big customers is Snap. They, uh, this was their right performance uh, when the World Series won. Uh, they, that peak is uh, 3.7 million writes per second. Uh, it's about three times their normal load, and it just worked. Um, and we've, we've had many um, experiences like that with Snap. And you know, so they, they knew this was coming, obviously. Uh, they, they scaled up for it. It worked. They scaled back down. They don't have to pay for that for the rest of the year until Christmas, New Year's Eve, whenever the next uh, big event is. And, and they gave a talk to, uh, it's definitely be up on YouTube. I don't know if there's going to be a second talk or not. But uh, if you check that out, Snap in the data track, I think. Um, if you listen to the 
Andy's keynote, uh, the uh, CIO of NFL was here talking about their partnership with AWS. Uh, one of the partnerships we have is Thursday Night Football, which is streamed through Amazon Prime Video. Um, AWS Media Services uh, powers that, um, that stream, does ad and search, and we have 1.6 million viewers. It's a worldwide audience, and yes, uh, it's being driven by DynamoDB. Obviously, you know, the NFL guards their properties very, very seriously. They take um, any glitches very, very seriously, and they trusted us, and we've had no problems. You've heard of Prime Day, which is um, one of Amazon's big shopping days of the year, Prime Day, uh, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday being the big three. Um, and you know, this is thousands of AWS accounts and teams, and um, let's see. We've said at peak, they were consuming 2.9 million requests per second in DynamoDB. And I just want to make clear, that was not what DynamoDB was doing. That wasn't even a majority of DynamoDB's traffic at that time. That was just the AWS retail website's traffic to DynamoDB. And again, it just happened, uh, scaled down, and uh, it just, everything was, was good. And, and Black Friday and Summer Monday went well. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, so. <laughs> Not that he would be fired, he just would still be working. I'd be in the war room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what, uh, what do I want to leave you with? So uh, as you lead into whatever the critical events are for your business, um, you know, think of all the things you can do if you don't have to think about these things, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the screen. Let DynamoDB manage all that for you. Uh, no downtime. Just think of what you can do. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. With than Jim, or if uh, I just am more lossy than Jim. Um, but uh, as soon as the people sort of fill out of the room, we have two microphones set up here for questions, and we'll take some questions. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the questions. Okay. Hi, really great announcements about Dynamo today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you touched on this earlier, but uh, if I want to do a backup and a restore on a global table, can I do the backup and the restore from within the configuration of a single region, or do I need to go to each region, change my configuration, backup, change my configuration, do the backup for that region? Yeah, so um, the backups, you just go to whatever region you want to take the backup in, you click the backup, and it's done. For restore right now, uh, global tables are only working on new tables. We are working very hard to enable it on existing tables. When that is true, you'll be able to restore them as well. Okay, so, so you can restore in a single region right now. You can't restore the whole global configuration until we get uh, existing tables uh, enabled for global tables. Even for a new table, if it's a well, new. Well, once you restore it, then it's not a new table anymore. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So um, but yeah, as soon as as soon as we get that working, which is very soon. Uh, we just didn't quite get it done for reInvent. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, over here. Yeah, great announcements today. Uh, so the question about uh, you, you do master master, right? And you write the timestamps. So which conflict resolution are you doing? Right now we're just doing last writer wins. Okay. Um, we certainly know that there are other people that want more choices and we'll be delivering those, but last Thank writer you. wins, yep. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, after you've taken a backup, are you able to share that between other AWS accounts? Yeah, so right now, no, um, but it's definitely a top ask, and we will be working on that for okay. sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, good talk. Uh, quick question. Have you ever had the need to you know, use or have a row size more than 400 KB, like when you use for Amazon or other places? Have you ever felt that 400 KB was less? Because I've had a use case where I wanted to use DynamoDB, but my row size was much more than 400 KB, and I was. Um, so you're asking if we have considered making items bigger than 400K? That's right. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes up periodically. Uh, oftentimes we ask, you know, uh, so in particular, we'd like to he hear that particular use case. Because um, oftentimes, you know, uh, when, when people, we talk closer with customers, a pattern more like, 
uh, you know, putting some data out in S3 and having Dynamo be the reference to it, uh, you know, is, is actually the better pattern. Uh, that said, we're open to feedback, um, but oftentimes we get the question from an engineer like, hey, and we say, okay, well, what, what, what should it be? And, and it's like, well, infinite, and, and that, that doesn't help so much because uh, there are trade-offs in the system in terms of uh, recovery times and, and, and replication times and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, my, my Twitter handle is on the uh, th on the slide, so you can or you can come up later. I give you a card and you can give me your more right. use case. Well, thank you. Uh, so, is there any plan to allow multiple DynamoDBs with each AWS account? So, like, we have a multi-tenant environment. Yeah, I know. So, would we have to create a table with an acronym yeah, and no, I know. or uh, yeah. suffix? Yeah, no, it's it, uh, you're not the only customer. Both internal and external, you talk to me about that all the time. Uh, so, and we're we we love to listen to our customers and deliver the features they want. So, uh, I don't know that I'll say any more than that. But well, yeah, I mean, backup, restore, and and, and multi master replication were the, the biggest ass features. So, hopefully, as we clear those out, we can move on to some of the next ones. Yeah, no, I, it's it's a pain. I agree. Thank you. Hey, so uh, I haven't spent too much time with Dynamo, so I'm not fully aware of all the features that you offer, but one limitation that I noticed when I was uh, doing my example test with it was the fact that I couldn't filter based on like nested uh, nested keys within like nested maps inside the uh, items. Are there any plans to expand on that and add that feature? Because like, we had to do a scan and then yeah, yeah, do that no, in the application I, I level. Yeah, yeah. So for, the, for uh, nested attributes when you're using the JSON um, APIs for DynamoDB, you can't do a filter on mm -hmm. Some of the lower end. Uh, I don't have a time frame for adding that, but yeah, I hear you that okay. that is something that's useful. Cool. Uh, for the master master replication, the read unit cost and the write unit cost will be same. So as we add each region, it will double, triple. So for writes, you definitely have to write it in every region. So you have to have enough write capacity in every region to handle your full write load. Reads, it's whatever you're going to read in that region. So. You know, if you're doing a DR scenario, you know, reads in the standby region can be zero. Um, if you're doing active, active, they can be the same. Like it's so reads scale however you right. want them to scale. Um, but writes, yeah, you have to write everything goes everywhere for this version. And so, yeah, you have to scale every table to meet the global. And then what about the restore uh, from what the backup? Is yeah, that the write unit cost, the no, row so, size? Well, so basically the pricing is uh, storage per gigabyte, gigabyte month uh, stored. Uh, but this is a really important point, so uh, per, uh, perhaps I missed it. Uh, it do, be, when I said it doesn't impact the, the performance of your application, it's not using your provisioned IOPS from either your front-end application. Did you mean what's the cost for restore? It also was around that. Like, it is going to eat up my write units or read no. units. No, it didn't hit. None, none, nothing in backup or restore consumes your provision capacity in any way. Okay. Hey guys, uh, realize a region coming down is fairly unlikely, but um, if a region comes down hour or two hours, when it comes back up, do the global tables automatically resync? Yes. And is there any limitation on that if it's down for a day, two days, three days? Um, I mean, I guess if it's down forever, certainly it's not going to work. I mean, I, you know, I don't know that I have any concrete, like, if it goes down for this amount of time, it's going to be this impact. I mean, we've, um, but yes, they will resync. Generally, they resync. What's that? They generally just resync. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, everything will be redriven and reread and resynced. And, awesome. Yep. Great, thanks. Anybody over here? No? Okay, yep. So, are the incremental backups uh, charged uh, always full? So, every subsequent backup, I would be charged the same? Yeah, so um, as I said, we have two different backup features. One is the on-demand backups, which is GA today. One is the continuous backups, which support point-in-time restore, which will be, will be launched very soon. Um, so the on-demand backups, which we announced today, are really for long-term retention, and they are full backups. The continuous backups, if you're looking for you know, sort of daily backup scenario, we really envision that being supported by continuous backups, which will be launched very soon, you know, early in, in 2018. And that's, that's really what we envision for that. And that'll be, you won't be paying for every single backup. At that point. Okay. And uh, one more question. 
So mm -hmm. when I restore a table, so do I create a replica table or is do I override the table? No, it goes into a new table. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, this is just kind of a nit. Um, my teammates and I observe sometimes that the capacity graph in the metrics tab can lag the actual value shown in the uh, um, yeah, the capacity it, by, by, sometimes by several like minutes. I'm, I'm I, I, I know. Uh, <laughs> I'll make sure to mention he, it again to the he, team. He's been demoing. He's been trying out of our features and. Okay. and yeah. No. I first time I used auto scaling and basically my consumes is is exceeding my provisioned and I'm like, what the heck, guys? And it's basically because the consumes on a one minute metric and the auto scaling the the provisions on a five minute metric, so it looks stupid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It I would looks love dumb. Thank and you. I okay. know it's a nit, but we want to fix those. Thanks for mentioning. Too. I'll yep. give it extra weight to the team. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know how do how do consistent reads work with uh, global tables? Is it does it wait for the sync or is it eventually consistent? Uh, yeah. So um, with global tables, we are doing asynchronous re replication between the regions, and so um, you know it's a think of it as a bunch of normal DynamoDB tables, and we handle replication between them. So if you do a write into a region and then strongly consistent or eventually consistent read in that same region, you get your normal behavior. In the other region, you get what is strongly consistent in that region. So we don't today, and obviously, you know, there are people that want it, and we, you know, will certainly be looking at that. There's no way to say, I want a globally consistent read right. today. Okay. Thanks. Hey, uh, two questions. One is about the uh, backup format and the size. Um, so if uh, on the overview, it says data size 10 gigabytes. What's the general um, general size of the backup? Um, and then two is uh, the actual backup format. Is it something similar to the the EMR um, backup uh, or the EMR export um, format? Yeah. So um, in terms of the backup size, we are charging based on table size for backup. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, in terms of the backup format. Right now, we aren't giving people access to the backups, but okay. certainly export is a very highly requested feature, mm -hmm. and we certainly would want it to be able to play in the AWS ecosystem when we do that. Right. Uh, the second question is, um, I have a use case where uh, um, I do a lot of batch writes, and then I also have a situation um, basically where I want to update those records, but I have all of the data for you know, 100 records at the same time. And right now, I have to update, and I'm just starting to update one or two um, attributes per um, per row. Um, uh, doing batch updates versus having to update each one of those records individually. I was wondering if there's anything um, considered on the roadmap for batch updates. Uh, why don't I talk to you after this? Let me. I just want to really make sure I understand sure. the use case Absolutely. rather than take everyone's time. Yeah. So yeah, if you just hang out. Quick question. It's uh, are joins available between the tables? Because we have a huge Mongo uh, applications, and if consider that to go to um, Dynamo, because they're joining some tables, and that's available in Mongo. Just wondering. Yeah, so right now we do not offer any joins in DynamoDB. I mean, I think one of the tenets that we have in DynamoDB is uh, you get predictable performance. And you know, the problem with joins is you can write what looks like a very simple query and it performs really well and then all of a sudden it falls off the cliff. So, you know, it, it's something that is super valuable and, and we want to think about ways to offer it, but we, we cannot compromise on the predictability of our performance. So, uh, right now, no. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we currently use MongoDB and our use case is basically a key, a hash and a blob of data, whether it's JSON or CSV or what have you. You're kind of pushing the limits of Mongo. You're wondering if S3 is the path, path forward or DynamoDB. Do you have any suggestions? Um, again, it sort of really depends on your details. I'm happy to talk to you offline. Sounds good. Uh, any other questions? We'll, we'll be outside. Uh, oh, thanks wait, a lot. Maybe one more. Um, would you ever have a global endpoint so that you wouldn't have to go by region? That is a great suggestion. <laughs> I love it. I will not commit to anything, but yes, that is a great suggestion. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it.